Hey everybody, my name is Jason. This is part two of my series on how to canoe. In this video, we're gonna look at some basic canoe handling techniques. So before we get started on actual paddling techniques, I wanna just quickly go over how to load your canoe. So if you're paddling a solo canoe like I will be today, you basically wanna put the weight in front of you and towards the bow of the canoe, that's the front of the canoe. That'll help offset the weight so that it's equally distributed and so that the bow isn't sticking up in the air from all of the weight sitting back at the stern with you. If you're paddling a tandem canoe, that's a two-person canoe, you wanna evenly distribute the weight in the same way. So if the heavier person's at the back, you wanna put more of the weight towards the front. And with both types of canoes, you wanna make sure that you try to distribute the weight so that your load is down low so it has a lower center of gravity as well as it's not sticking up above the gunnels. The more you have sticking up above the gunnels, including the people, the more surface area you'll have that the wind will easily be able to catch and it can become more difficult to paddle. Another important thing is that you also want to make sure that your load is distributed so that it's along the center of your canoe and not have heavier items all to one side. This might not tip the canoe, but it might. More likely, it's just gonna make it awkward as you paddle and you'll need to readjust the way you sit to counterbalance the weight. So the main points to remember are to just evenly distribute the weight within the canoe and try to keep the weight below the gunnels as well as along the center of the canoe. Okay, so before we head out on the water, there's one more thing that I should talk about before we get into paddle techniques, and that's canoe safety. So I highly encourage you to check out what the safety regulations are in your area because they will differ from state to state or province to province and country to country. The most important piece of equipment that you're gonna have is your PFD, your personal flotation device, otherwise known as your life jacket, okay? So the life jacket is definitely an important piece of equipment and required, I think, everywhere. If not, it should be. So life jackets do save lives, but you have to make sure that it fits properly and that it's also done up properly. So what that means is when you put it on, you don't want to be able to lift up and have it ride up way above your ears, okay? So most of them will have straps somewhere and you just cinch up those straps to make sure that it's nice and snug, but at the same time, so that the comfort still allows you to move freely and breathe easily. So some of the other safety equipment that is likely required is a, some kind of signaling device, like a peeless whistle or an air horn. So I carry both. Air horn is just a tiny little thing, very loud. Also a bailing device and possibly a throw rope might be necessary. So for a bailing device, I just bring a, a milk jug and I have a, a 50 foot throw rope. So some people might be thinking that uh, a throw rope is kind of useless if you're out paddling by yourself. Uh, but the truth is 50 feet of rope is useful in all kinds of situations, not just a rescue device. So for me, I think it's just a handy bit of kit to pack along. And truthfully, you never know if you're going to come across somebody out there who needs rescuing. And really, to have the rope is a simple thing to pack. Another thing that you'll likely require is a flashlight of some sort, especially if you're going to be out after dark. So for me, I pack two. I pack a tiny waterproof flashlight as well as a waterproof headlamp.
Okay, so before we start looking at different paddle strokes, I thought that I'd show you a few different paddles that I brought along and explain the differences. It might help you with determining how to choose a paddle. So this is a beaver tail paddle and it's a longer blade. This is a very traditional canoe paddle. It's laminated, solid wood, uh, which is a good thing. It means that there's more than one piece of wood typically Paddles that have more than one piece of wood glued together are stronger and will last longer than solid one piece paddles. Um, it's got a nice curved grip and the weight is medium, I would say. So to size your paddle, what you want to do is basically have your hand on the grip and then on the shaft and hold your hand up above your head like this and your arms should be pretty much straight up okay now to paddle what you want to do is have your hands just slightly in a little bit so when looking at wooden canoe paddles one thing that you want to do when shopping is just look at the grain along the shaft and you don't want to have too much grain run out so basically the straighter the grain if you can see that there's grain that runs the full length of the shaft and down into the blade that's what you want if you have a wood grain that comes out then that blade or that paddle is likely going to break on you down the road another feature on this paddle is the tip and some paddles have that uh, it's a reinforced tip uh, this company, uh, Bending Branches, uh, they call it Rock Guard, and basically it will protect the tip of your blade for a lot longer than it would if it didn't have it. So finding a paddle with uh, protection on the tip is definitely worth the investment. So the next paddle I'm going to show you is a expedition style or tripping style paddle. Uh, it's got a T-grip handle this time. Uh, the T-grip is something that you need to get used to a little bit. It's not as contoured as uh, the beaver tail or other paddles might have. But when you compare this style of grip with what uh, like professional athletes, sprint canoers, or uh, slalom, or you know, athletes are using, uh, they're all using a T-grip because it's gonna stay in your hand much longer, less likely to slip. And really it doesn't take much to adjust to it. Um, it's become my favorite grip and something that I now look at in a paddle. So this paddle is uh, 56 inches. And again, this is a uh, bending branches paddle. Um, now Bending Branches isn't paying me to talk about their paddles. Uh, they just happen to be a paddle company that I really like. Uh, I like their products and have used them for years. So um, it's what I have to show you. So this one is uh, their Expedition paddle. It's got a fiberglass blade so it's still all wood but it's uh, the wood is uh, encased in a layer of fiberglass to give the blade more strength and it's got the the rock guard protection all the way around the blade down into the throat section uh, here of the blade uh, and travels up quite far so this gives this specific paddle quite a bit of durability um, I used this paddle for quite a while and it's still in great shape. Um, this was one of my favorite styles of paddle for a long time until I discovered my new paddle, which I'll get to in a moment. So one thing with this paddle as well is that uh, if I compare the two, we can really see about the, the difference in the length of the blade as well as the width. So you can see uh, the Expedition or Tripping Paddle is uh, much wider and the Beaver Tail Paddle uh, comes to here and is much longer. So when we talk about length of paddles, uh, basically you just want to consider that it's the surface area of the paddle that's going to propel you through the water. So with a beaver tail, you're going to put more paddle blade into the water and that's going to propel you. 
Um, but in shallow water, you won't be able to get the paddle as deep into the water, and so you'll have much less surface area of a paddle getting into the water and helping to propel you. So I don't have one, but there's also an otter tail style paddle, which is even longer than a beaver tail and narrower. Um, they're my least favorite. I'd say they're very good for open water, but uh, in shallows, uh, not the best. So uh, here around where I paddle, I have deep water, but then a lot of shallow area as well. Uh, so I could use a beaver tail and be quite happy with it, but for me a paddle blade that's a little bit shorter but wider is going to uh, just get into the water and give me more surface area even in a shallower depth of water. So I would say as well that uh, again if you look at the professional athletes who are using uh, paddles they're also typically a much wider blade obviously they want to get as much water moving as they can uh, so that they can win their sport so now this is my new paddle uh, it's a few years old and starting to show its wear but the same as the tripping paddle I just showed you it's got a uh, fiberglass on the outside to protect the wood. It's got the rock guard uh, reinforcement along the edge of the blade and the tip. Um, what's really nice about this paddle is that it's got a carbon fiber shaft which is super light and also very strong. So the blade on this is a little bit shorter than the tripping paddle and that cuts down on weight as well and the paddle still gets to depths of the water so that you're not just paddling the surface area of the water um, which you can imagine in waves or froth uh, there's not much uh, substance there to you know really dig into so you want to get a little bit deeper uh, the paddle also has a T-grip handle, which I like, um, and yeah, so all up, I've been incredibly happy with this style of paddle, and yeah, I think it's the bee's knees. Really, it uh, comes down to preference, you know, unless you're uh, going to be spending days and days on the water and uh, fine-tune your paddle and your canoe and all of your gear. Uh, you're going to want to get something that uh, suits the water that you're paddling in. Uh, it's not too heavy and is the right length for you. So there is one more type of paddle and sometimes you'll see solo canoeists with a kayak paddle like this. Um, of course uh, the canoeists using these paddles don't refer to them as kayak paddles but they are double bladed paddles and this one's similar to uh, my favorite carbon fiber paddle here uh, also has a carbon fiber shaft and uh, just the same as the rest it has some protection along the outer edge uh, now these features some of them you know the carbon fiber shaft and the protection on the edge will increase the cost of the paddle but uh, if you're going to be serious and use your canoe often it's well worth the investment um, the double bladed paddle really doesn't suit me for uh, canoeing I don't care for all of the spray the dripping of the paddle coming off um, from time to time I do bring it and I found it useful uh, when the conditions get uh, kind of windy and I want two blades going I can travel a lot faster or even if you know it could be the end of the day and I just want to get back to the car and uh, traveling fast is important but for most of the time the speed that I can travel with a regular canoe paddle is adequate for me and uh, you know canoeing for me is about getting out on the water relaxing uh, enjoying the day. It's not really about traveling super fast.
Okay, so let's talk about paddling strokes. There's basically four different paddle strokes that you want to learn, and that would be the forward stroke, the back stroke, the pry, and the draw. Okay, and then depending on where you place those paddling strokes is going to determine what direction the canoe moves. So your forward stroke is obviously going to propel you forward, your back stroke is going to pull you in reverse, your pry is going to push you opposite of whatever direction the paddle is on. So if I pry on the left side of my boat away, the canoe will move to the right and my draw is going to pull me in the direction that the paddle's on. So the basic front stroke or forward stroke is really basic and easy. Uh, nothing technical about it, but you definitely want to build on it with another stroke later on. So the forward stroke is typically used by the person sitting at the front of the canoe in a tandem canoe, um, but from time to time it's used by the person on the back or even a solo canoeist as well. The stroke is just very simple of putting the blade into the water, propelling forward, pulling out the paddle from the water and bringing it forward to follow again. From time to time, the forward stroke is used when paddling solo, usually at times in high winds or just in between different strokes like the J stroke or the Canadian stroke. Now, as you can see from the background, as I do that, the canoe wants to slightly turn to the right, the opposite side that the paddle is on. And that's why we learn other strokes as well, such as the J stroke. So the first stroke that people usually do while learning to canoe is nicknamed the goon stroke or the goonie and basically it's a forward stroke and then at the end it's a pry. So reaching out, paddle in, and pull back and then pry. And what this does is it helps to correct the direction of the canoe and keep you going forward. The problem is, every time you do a pry, you kind of hit the brakes a little bit, just because of the position of the paddle, and when you pry out, you do have a little bit of a reverse direction. So, what's important to notice is that with the goon stroke, my thumb is up, and my thumb always stays up in the paddling stroke. The next type of forward stroke is referred to as the J stroke. And no, it's not named after me. The J stroke is very similar to the Guni stroke, except that this time we tilt our thumb down as we make our draw. The J stroke is a much more efficient and fluent stroke and it's definitely a preferred stroke with experienced paddlers. Once you have the J stroke, there's a couple variations. There's the Canadian stroke, which basically incorporates the gunnel. And this is just a, I guess a lazier J stroke, but because Canadians are used to doing long canoe trips, we're also familiar with, you know, wrist ache and arm ache, and the Canadian stroke takes a lot of the pressure off of the wrist as you're paddling. You still turn the, the paddle so that it would be thumbs down like a J stroke, except you incorporate the gunnel and can slide your paddle down the gunnel for a little bit of assistance. And finally, the last forward stroke that I'm going to talk about is nicknamed the Indian stroke, but more commonly called the silent stroke. And with the silent stroke, 
it's basically a J-stroke, except you leave the paddle in as you push your paddle forward and then make your next draw. One unique aspect about the silent stroke is that instead of turning your thumb up or down, you actually rotate the shaft within your hand. So the grip does a full rotation with every stroke. So the next two strokes are the draw and the pry. And now, like I've already mentioned, depending on where you place either of those strokes along the side of your canoe will determine how the canoe reacts. But basically, the draw is to reach out with your paddle and then pull the paddle towards you. And now you can see, if I pull towards the back of the canoe, it will turn my canoe or I can pry near the back and I can turn it in the opposite direction or I can draw towards the center of the canoe and I can move the canoe horizontally sideways or I can place my paddle up towards the front and do a draw or pry to also turn the canoe. When doing your draw you can do it so that you reach out and then put your blade in and pull, and then lift your paddle out, and then back in and pull and lift it out. Or you can practice to leave your paddle in and do your draw and turn the blade sideways and cut back and then draw again. You turn the blade sideways and cut back and then draw in again. And the same can be said with the pry, where I can pry, turn my blade sideways and cut in and then pry turn my blade sideways and pry so with the draw there's a variation known as the sculling draw and the best way to explain or the best way I've explained it before is it's like moving your paddle as though you're icing a cake and you put your blade down into the water and then move it forward and back while also drawing towards you and once you get the right angle probably a 45 degree angle and when you begin to add enough pressure into the water your canoe will begin to draw sideways the final paddling stroke that we're going to look at is the back stroke and as the name implies, it's to move your canoe in a reverse direction. So this might be used when pulling away from a dock or landing, or also if there's an obstacle in your way and you want to give yourself just enough more space. And basically it's as simple as the name suggests that you just place the paddle in the water and stroke backwards until the blade comes up out and then back and again. Okay, so once again, we've covered a lot of information in this video. So here's a link to the video I promised. It's the first in the series on how to canoe. If you haven't already, I hope you check it out. Now, if you like this video, please give it the thumbs up, leave a comment, and if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. All right, thanks for watching.